So I know there's a few of you that like the antique style of aircraft, right? So behind me is a Fokker D7, 80% scale, and we're gonna walk all around it right now. Experimental aircraft, kit planes, home-built aircraft, hobby planes. These are the names we hear given to these personal aircraft today. But whichever name you give these unique aircraft, one word stands out that encompasses all. Freedom. And what better way to experience freedom than in your very own wind-in-your-face open cockpit airplane. And that is exactly what Burt Sparrow built here in Alabama. Hey, I'm Bert Sparrow here, a retired Air Force officer about 10 years ago, retired at Air War College faculty in central Alabama. And I've been flying this 80% uh, Fokker D7 Aerodrome Airplanes kit for about eight years now. I've got probably 150 hours on it and 500 takeoff and landings. It's an open cockpit biplane and uh, it is, it is a it is it's a handful to handle, and it is squirrely and a blast, and it keeps you on your toes. And uh, it's funny, I can land at an airport with a $300,000 airplane, and I come taxiing up and people like this. And uh, if you can't tell that I'm an Alabama fan, uh, red and white, well then roll tide. That's why that's the color it is. But uh, it has a, uh, a Valley Engineering and Culver Props, same company, so this is a culver prop, 84 inches long. So you figure if I'm, I'm uh, 6'2", that's 74 inches. This is 10 inches longer than I am tall. And uh, a German replica, got to have Volkswagen, right? One of the reasons why uh, Robert and uh, Culver Props, Larry and Elena them, they have this deal where this is essentially a, a hot rod VW, so it's bored and stroked to about 100 uh, horsepower, and it's a 520 pound airplane. Uh, I take off in about 800 to 1,000 feet climb per minute. Cruise is about 75, uh, something like that. But again, it's low and slow, and it's a blast to fly. And I, I was telling Brian here that I fly with mainly Cubs and Champs, and it's like, oh, if we need to do a 360, I'll do a yank and pull from 60 degree bank, and uh, I've already done my 360 like that. Uh, it will, uh, uh, it'll also challenge your skills on wheel landings or three-point landings. And I'm to the point now where I only do uh, exclusive uh, uh, three-point landings. But this is, uh, this is Robert's kit, and uh, it's got the, the, the Valley Engineering engine and redrive and prop, the combination deal they used to offer. And uh, this is, I just powder coated the, uh, the side panels. This is loosely based on Just 18 or Squadron 18. And there's a Lieutenant Kurt Monnington from uh, 1917 and 18, the Death Dealer. And I was like, well, how can you have a World War I airplane that doesn't have a skull and a crossbone? So there you go, I found that, and that's actually not a decal. That's actually, uh, that's actually been painted on here. And uh, I, get, I get more people, you know, kids will walk up and, uh, and they're like, oh wow, they're just blown away about that. But uh, most pilots will come in and they'll look in the, the, the one of the, the, the really advantages of a home-built airplane is I have owned airplanes that the previous owner was five foot six or five foot eight. And I'm not super tall, but at six two, I designed this specifically for me based on like the Lamborghini uh, seat uh, angles. And so I'm sitting in there that's super com comfortable and I can install my, my pedals however I want. Uh, I've got a 13 gallon tank and uh, basic steam gauges and uh, fake Spandau uh, guns. I think for a winter project, 
I'll go ahead and talk to, to Daryl Porter in, uh, in Missouri and get him to make me some propane guns that if you've ever heard a propane gun on a World War plane, it, a World War I plane, it will get your attention. But uh, this is an open cockpit biplane flying in the fields of Alabama. It doesn't really get much better than that. I mean, I can fly mostly year round and even if it's 40, 50 degrees, you just bundle up and uh, put your goggles on and go fly. The interior is uh, one of the things I noticed that when I was building the plane is I wanted to get the seat as low as possible because a lot of builders will build it with their seat very high and therefore their head and they, they look like they're a seven foot giant flying the plane. So a real traditional D7 has the side of the plane hitting you in about the, the upper shoulder. If you look at the way I set this up here, this is essentially a piece of wood and I just drilled it out myself. My theory here is aircraft, uh, aircraft instruments on the top, engine instruments on the bottom. So vertical speed, altimeter, compass, and airspeed, and of course the ball indicator, and, um, and then down on the bottom is all my engine instruments. Down here, that's the fuel tank. The fuel tank is, is right there in front of your knees. And again, I, I installed those where I sat and I felt was comfortable to me. I fabricated the heel, uh, the heel brake uh, myself, and it's just kind of pushed so I can do differential braking if needed. And um, this stick right here, you can see if you look out at the aileron, I get I get way wicked amounts of throw. But here's the crazy thing: I fly this thing with two fingers, and one little finger move to the left. Man, I don't ever get anywhere near the max travel. I have control stops, but you can fly with your finger. The amount of uh, responsiveness to this airplane is, is really crazy. Well, let's talk about the construction of this uh, and this kit. Did you have to build up any specific jigs or how did you get this frame straight? So that's a great question. And to that end, I'll say I use basic construction methods it was just, I mean, if you've got a drill press and you've got uh, basic kind of shop tools, nothing fancy, I did buy a Harbor Freight brake, but essentially, like the fuselage, one of the first things you're gonna do is you're gonna build the fuselage upside down. Not the turtle deck right there, but from the launcher on straight back is gonna be straight and level, and you build that, and then you're just gonna use a level and okay, this former is vertical now, now I'm gonna rivet in a gusset. And then you do the next one and the next one, and then you actually just put some cross ones, cross formers in. And then for, for the wings, for example, uh, I, I got a four by eight table, and you have to bend the ribs to give you that airfoil look. And all you really do is if you've got a wooden table, you just screw in and, and like a half inch uh, tube, you put that in there and you get it, you follow Robert's uh, building uh, uh, directions and you see what it's supposed to be and you actually just put pieces of, uh, uh, of jigs and you make your own little things and that way you can repeat uh, rib after rib after rib because every single one of these ribs is identical. Uh, essentially a J3 Cub airfoil if you will, but um, I built it on a four foot by eight foot level table and, um, and uh, no specific jigs uh, other than like the, the rounded rudder. Uh, you just end up on a flat table. You're just, you have the outline on there on a piece of, of uh, you know, paper or something, butcher paper, and you see where it is and you bend it and you bend it and then you just end up screwing in a wooden block next to it to hold it. And what fabric process did you go with or um, it, was it yeah. some antique way of doing this? Yeah, so that's, that's the million dollar question. So here I am building in 2014-15 and there was this new thing called Oratex that I was like, oh wow. The problem is, is it's so shiny and you are limited to colors. 
Uh, I actually was in a Kit Plains article with, with Dan Horton and we did a strength test on this Fokker rudder. And so my choices were Oratex, Stewart, Polyfiber, or Robert has his own thing for a set price, which was actually cheaper than all the others. I could buy all the material and all the glue from him. Having previously covered in Stewart's, it was amazing Robert's looked very similar to Stewart's, but I used Robert's uh, covering kit, which is essentially 1950s Seconite. If you, that's just, this is an aluminum. Of course, there's a spar here, okay? And there's a piece of aluminum right here that ends here, and then there's the ribs. But this is essentially uh, 1950s Seconite, and the covering is that water-based Stewart systems. It's kind of this turquoise stuff. If I had it to do all over again, one thing that I would change is I would have, I would have put better primer over what was gonna be white. Because when you have this turquoise and white fabric, what happens is over about every two years, the tur turquoise will start to come through. So if I would have put a primer, kind of like kills or something like that, that would have kept that done. But this is a sec this is uh, most people that have an, an, an old World War I plane. This is latex exterior home paint because all the UV protection is in that paint. And so the first thing you're gonna do when you're covering this is you're gonna do all, you're gonna follow AC 43, blah, blah, blah. And you're gonna do your gluing and you're gonna do your, uh, your, your rivet reinforcement and your, your, your pinking tapes and all that. And then you're gonna heat it and get it, <clears throat> get it done, but you paint the whole thing white. And once everything has like two, maybe three light coats of white, then you can do another coat of paint and that makes it much more brilliant. Now this is house latex paint. Are this, you spraying this, rolling this, or brushing it? This, well, it's funny because I've heard everything and in between. Now, if you can imagine, how am I going to paint the underside of my airplane? Every time I started to tilt my spray gun back, it would quit. So I rolled the bottom, okay? But the sides were painted in my backyard in Prattville, Alabama. And the funny thing is, you don't want to do it in direct sun, but there's a funny thing that happens in the south at about five, six o'clock at night is June bugs or love bugs or whatever, they will dive at your fresh paint. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com. AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com. Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. South Mississippi Light Aircraft at FlySMLA.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at flyfoxtrot95.com. Edge Performance at edgeperformance.no. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, and so much more. All right, so let's paint a realistic picture of what it's like to fly this thing and the speeds you operate at. Okay, um, most of my foundational training is in a Cub. And when I, you fly this particular airplane, when you taxi it out, and the, the, the tail is raised right now, but the sight picture is what you, many of you would know of as being a pits. You cannot see anything in front of you and you have this high angle of attack. And think of this, here you are a pilot. You have a wing, and then you have a wing. You got fake machine guns, and you have cables. You have all this stuff going on. So you have to actually S-turn all of your taxis, because you don't want a kid coming out or anything like that, um, because things will, will, will jump out at you. The, the, the scary sight picture for many is you cannot see the runway. And you see this with pits flyers, which is when you're turning base to final, you see the runway, but then you can't see the runway anymore once you turn final. And it's the same way in this airplane. High angle of attack, 
and it, the visibility is just not there. So you end up landing like this, and it's not so much the Lindbergh reference, but you're looking to the left and you have to get used to where am I in relation to being how high I am off the ground. So one of the things I notice in this plane is, is while the Stearman community is 65, 65, 65, this is essentially really the same thing. I take off, it dip, if I take off on a typical day, I'm taking off at 55 and I'm approaching at 55. Crews might be 75 miles an hour. I fly with mostly cubs and champs and we're all flying about 70, 75. The funny thing is, it's like, oh, we need to do a 360 to wait for Bob or we need to, to do a 180. I can yank, not very far, but yank and pull and I do a 360 like that and they're still just a quarter away through their lumbering turn. So fighter replicas and fighters in general are designed to be inherently unstable and not that this is unstable, it's not. Stall is about 45, really probably a true 42, 43. It lets you know. You do get a little bit of uh, buffeting. The left wing will drop just a hair but just using, again, I can fly with a thumb and a fingertip, slightly push forward, and then boom, I'm right out of it. One of the biggest things I had to learn with, think of this, all the cables, the extra wings, the end struts, the axle wing, the exposed brakes, all the things that cause drag. One of the things that I've noticed is the least little bit of flare or back pressure on the stick, it's like a kite. Whew. So, so I have to, it's a funny thing. You have to fly under power almost all the way down to the numbers. So you're flying down under power to the numbers and, and then once you start to, to level off or flatten out, you can't see anything ahead of you. So, so briefly, as an Airdrome, Airblo Air, Airdrome Airplanes kit, uh, Robert Bosley's the owner based in, in Missouri. What, what happens when you, when you get the kit is I got this huge box of parts of aluminum and you get the building instructions and a building DVD. His tech support, he never not answered the phone. As a first time builder, I'd call him two, three times a week, uh, two, three times a day and he would answer the phone. So what you get is this kit of parts and a DVD and building instructions and great tech support from, from Robert. Thank you, Bert, for the hangar and airplane tour at your place there in Alabama. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for watching.